All right. Uh, today is Wednesday, October 16th. This class is being recorded. Uh, what we're going to do today is get into the third part of the class, which is on valuation. Okay. So you're going to need to download screen here. in the files folder. In the subfolder called Nike, <clears throat> a file called uh, valuation model start uh, nike.xlsx, okay? And I'll give you a minute to do that. <clears throat> but while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to pass out the sign-in sheet, so make sure you sign the sign-in sheet for attendance before you leave today. And while you're getting that file downloaded, uh, I want to check on two quick things. One, <clears throat> Today, the first half of the Bloomberg Trading Challenge ends at 5 p.m. So I'm gonna to go to the Bloomberg Trading Challenge and do a check-in. This is section 401. And here is the ranking as of right now, All right? So the trading challenge does not end until 5 p.m. approximately today. So after the last section, mark is closed. I'll do a screenshot of this. Uh, make sure you don't have more than 300,000 in cash. Don't liquidate. Uh, everybody's met the criteria for 10 longs, and this would be the ranking. Now, again, it's close enough that the winner is not, there's still four hours to go. So the winner could change. But nonetheless, if it end right now, uh, S Moss would be in first place and they would get five points. Uh, the next two teams would get four, then three, then two, then one. Okay. But again, what matters is not right now. It's what we're going to end at the end of the day today. Okay. So that'll be the first half of the trading challenge. What I'm then going to do is I'm going to basically clone these six teams and I'm going to create a new trading challenge for your section, which will have two H after it. Okay. So whoever your team captain is will still be your team captain. When they come to the screen, they'll be two. They'll be the first half, which after today doesn't matter anymore. You can do whatever you want. And then the one called 2H, which will be the second half. Everyone will be reset to a million dollars. Okay, We wipe out all things that happened in the first half. And then you start again for six more weeks, the second half of the semester. Okay, And it'll be available starting tomorrow. Okay, So starting tomorrow, <clears throat> same rules. You need to do at least 10 longs in the second half of the semester. You want to buy the same stocks, that's up to you. Uh, but otherwise, 10 new longs. And by next Wednesday, one week from today, you have to be below $300,000 in cash and stay there. So you got a week to get out of cash. Okay. And so again, just when you get here, you have to drop down 2H tomorrow, and then it'll say a million dollars. Questions about the trading challenge? As I said, in this section, this is incredibly close. So... It's kind of like the photo finish in the horse race. We'll see who ends up winning. All right. All right. <clears throat> so the other thing before we get into the valuation uh, is Monday, <clears throat> you have your team presentation on the historical analysis. Any questions about Monday's presentation? Yes. So when we do the presentation, we're going to do it similar to the last one. Uh, yeah, you need to put in a slideshow, okay? Minimum the ROIC tree and the CFI. Uh, now, I want some context about what's going on, so you could put that in a slide two or something. But, or for example, because that ROIC tree could be hard to read on one slide, maybe you put the first level on one slide, like the second level on another slide, just because it's a little easier to see. But regardless, you got to put it to a PowerPoint, have one of your team members submit that PowerPoint by 10 a.m., okay, on behalf of the team, and then 10 minute presentations. All six teams will present next Monday. Okay, similar process. You can choose who's presenting on behalf of the team, 
Just make sure that across the four presentations, everyone eventually presents on the team. Okay, leave it up to your teams. And again, two or three days later, peer reviews. So make sure you submit the peer reviews by next week. Other questions about the presentation? Okay, so we are moving <clears throat> into the third section of the class on building a reusable DCF valuation model. Okay, that's kind of what we're doing next. And so what we've done now <clears throat> is we forecasted, or sorry, we've looked at historical statements. Now we're gonna start forecasting the financial statements of the cash flows to create those valuations. And we are gonna be building a reusable model, okay? Now you've already kind of done some of this in your last homework assignment, but what I'm gonna do is basically give you this file, which has a few more things in it, which I'm about to go over, that we're all gonna to build together, okay? So today, next Wednesday, we're gonna build this Excel model, the reusable valuation model together, starting with the file you just downloaded, right? So everything that I do, you do. Matter of fact, your homework for Monday is pretty straightforward. If you get to the point where we do at the end of class today and you match my model, you have completed homework eight and you can submit it and it's easy two points. Okay, that's it. There's no write up. It's just get to where we do in the first half of the model. Today, that's homework eight. If you don't, you have between now and Monday to get there. And again, this class is being recorded. Right? Now, <clears throat> it's, it's a binary assignment. You either match everything and get two points or you don't, you get a zero. Okay, so it's very important that you do everything that I do in class today. So today, next Wednesday, we are going to build the reusable valuation model on Nike. I've decided I want to do Nike, right? I think it's interesting what's going on with the company, uh, with their valuation. So I thought we would do that as a group, right? And so next two weeks, two and a half weeks, we'll talk about Nike and the valuations. Once we build this model over the next two weeks, <laughs> it will take you all of 10 minutes to do your next assignment, at least on the valuation side, right? It's actually very straightforward. It's a very reusable model, okay? So we're building a reusable model. You kind of did that for the last homework assignment, which you're using for your group projects. So what is that file? Let's go back to the Nike file that I gave you. So you'll take this file, Take this file and you would have downloaded it and opened it. Okay, so the file that I've given you is very similar to your last homework assignment. It's got similar tabs. So this is the income statement. This is the balance sheet. This is change in equity. This is the correct TFI mapped this is the correct TII mapped. This is the correct CFI mapped. And this is the EP mapped. And this is the ROIC tree mapped, okay? So technically, if you had put the data in for next week's homework uh, group project presentations into this file, everything would flow through correctly and work. So if you have a member on your team that has a file that works, use that. If you're worried about it, you could actually use this one to do your group project presentation, right? Because it's really very similar in terms of structure, right? Except this has a couple more things, right? And it starts with the income tab. The income tab and the balance sheet tab is the standardized statement with Nike's data in it. Okay, I put that in today, right? Except where did the data come from? It's everything in our model that we're building is sourced to Bloomberg. So we're building a model exclusively sourced to Bloomberg. If you had a different data source, CapIQ, Thompson's, whatever, it's not gonna work. You'd have to remap everything, right? So it turns out that Bloomberg actually does not have a standardized income statement and balance sheet across all companies, right? They have five. We figured that out over the years. So the standardized statement is actually five different statements. Well, that's a problem because it's gotta be the same every time. So that's why in this model, we built a standardized income statement and balance sheet. So here's the deal. How do we feed that model? That is the first tab called the model data tab, okay? So this is a data export from Bloomberg, row by row of income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow data for six historical years, okay? A future homework assignment will involve you creating this, 
in your Bloomberg terminal. So you can export the data, the raw data, kind of like ingredients for the model. What this tab does is this maps to create the income statement and balance sheets. <clears throat> okay. So basically we have the raw materials, which are on the model data tab, which feed the income statements and balance sheets. Okay. And in a standardized format. Okay. And that then flows through to create all the economic statements in the CFI. And then what we're going to do is we are going to forecast companies with some of your future, future cash flows. And so to forecast the cash flows, the process that we're going to use, best practice that's talked about in the book, is you forecast ratios to forecast future statements. You don't forecast the statements directly. Okay. So there is a tab in here called ratios. This tab has income statement and balance sheet ratios as a percentage of sales with every ratio with the one exception of the revenue growth rate, which is a percentage in change in sales, okay? But basically this tab are the historical ratios for the income statements and the balance sheets, okay? What we're about to start doing, which that, when I say that, go, no, we're gonna all start doing what I do, is we're gonna start forecasting the ratios. And those forecasted ratios will create the forecasted income statements and balance sheets and therefore the forecasted cash flows, okay? So historical numbers create historical ratios. Historical ratios lead to forecast ratios. Forecast ratios lead to forecasted statements, okay? And that's the best practice, right? And so <clears throat> why do we need the historical ratios? They're a baseline, right? So it's not that the past repeats itself, but we need a baseline to build our forecast on. And that's what this tab is. So this tab is the year-by-year -year ratios. A second best practice, and this goes beyond this class, we're gonna start changing these ratios in the future, right? Or realistic forecast for Nike or any other company, right? When we change those numbers, we're gonna reuse this model. And so when I change the numbers, they're gonna carry over, say I did Nike and I wanna do Home Depot, okay? Well, if I did Home Depot, the Nike data is still in there. So when I reuse the model, then the, the, the assumptions that I change for Nike are still in my Home Depot model, right? So in order to mitigate error, all the changes we're gonna make that are reusable across models are gonna be in two tabs, right? They're gonna be in the ratios tab and they're gonna be in a tab called assumptions. And so we're gonna minimize the place where the reusable changeable numbers are because I will guarantee you in the real world that if you build a model with assumptions scattered throughout you'll be up late, late at night trying to figure out what the problem is with your model because there's some reusable number that carried over that you, can, you forgot about and you're hunting it down and you're cursing and you're upset and you're miserable, right? So to avoid doing that, better practice, put all your assumptions in one place. In this case, we're gonna put on two tabs, okay? The difference in theory between the two tabs is ratios change year by year. So these are year by year assumptions that change. The other assumptions tab is called assumptions. These are universal assumptions, which go across all years. That's how I'm distinguishing between the two. Best practice number three. <clears throat> You'll notice these three cells on the assumptions tab are yellow, okay? We are gonna highlight in our model which cells we can change and which cells we shouldn't change because we got so many relative reference. I don't wanna break my model by writing over a formula, right? So how do I make sure I don't do that? In this class, anything that's changeable across models will be yellow. Okay, and that's how we're going to signal. Now, if you don't like yellow and you want to use purple, whatever, change the color, but we're going to use color to basically say, I can change this safely once I build that one up. And so we got three assumptions that we will change already. The WAC will be different by company. The operating cash might be different by company. And the last reported year will definitely change if we get new data. Right? So again, those are changeable assumptions. Questions about that before we get started? All right, so let's start building the forecast for Nike. Today, we're going to forecast the income statement and balance sheet. That's what we're going to try and finish this part of today. Okay, so therefore, we'll have forecasted CFIs. We're going to forecast six years, starting with the ratios. So now you're going to do what I do. Starting in cell H1, equal, write the word forecast. 
we're gonna have a lot of data and I wanna differentiate between what's real, actual, and what's forecasted when I actually print out the model and look at the model. <clears throat> the first forecast year is gonna be H3. Now this is a check we need to make. If I go back to my model data, Nike actually reported their 2024 because their fiscal year ends <clears throat> May 31st, right? It's not June or not December 31st. So they're already in fiscal 25 at Nike, right? Now my last reported year in my model says 2023. So in cell B2, change this to 2024. When you do that, those are the ratios that this went from 23 to 24. This is where point, change the ratio, change the assumption, flows through the model. Okay. All right, so our first forecast of the year for Nike is gonna be 2025. So in cell H2 equals G2 plus one. We don't wanna hard code the years, we wanna make them a relative reference. Okay, so next year is 2025. The first ratio we're gonna forecast is the revenue growth rate. So we're gonna do that, we're gonna say equals the previous year. We're gonna do that as a placeholder. So H3 equals G3, so 0.3%. And because that's something that can change, we're gonna make that yellow, okay, or whatever color you choose. Right? So again, don't do what I'm about to do. Actually, yes, yeah, sorry. Do what I'm about to do now, and I'll tell you not to in a second. So just to give you a sense of this, then go to the income tab, Cell H1, do this, type in forecast here. And same thing, H2 equals previous year plus one, so G2 plus one. So for 2025 revenue for Nike, right? here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say equals, so for H3, last year's revenue, so G3 times left paren, one plus the growth rate. So one plus ratios, H3, right paren. So if Nike, and I'm gonna go from H3 all the way down to H27, and I'm gonna format comma one decimal place just to match the formatting of the rest of the model, one decimal place. So if Nike grows 0.3% next year, their revenue will be 57507.4. Okay, so 51 billion, 507 million, okay? So basically this ratio creates that number, which is not yellow, okay? So now this is the part I don't want you to do, okay? Preview of next week. So right now as a placeholder, we're just gonna say whatever happened in 2024 repeats itself, okay? So all the numbers today are just gonna repeat 2024. But next week, we're going to put in more realistic numbers. So, for example, right now, if I go to Nike, in the consensus estimate today, Nike's revenue next year is expected to shrink to $47.6 billion, okay? which, as a growth percentage, is negative 7.3% shrinkage. So what we'll do next week is we'll say, okay, more realistic for Nike, Go in here to ratios, negative 7.31, and that will lead to 47.6 billion of revenue. Okay, so that's the point. The ratios will create the numbers. Okay, but I don't want you to do this yet because for today, I need us all to have the exact same model. So to have the exact same model today, we're just going to say 2024 repeats itself. Next week, we'll put in more realistic numbers for Nike. But this conceptually how things are going to work. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. So I'm going to undo this so that the number you should have in your income tab is 51507.4. Okay. Now, again, these income statement ratios are all now the rest of our percentage of revenue. The next one we're going to forecast is EBITDA. That's in gray, that's a key number to free cash flow. And so that's H7. So H7 equals G7. So EBITDA as a percentage of revenue in yellow stays at 13.8%. Now I have skipped over 
cost of goods sold and operating expenses and gross profit, right? Because <clears throat> what matters most is our EBITDA forecast for cash flow. Now, we can do the other numbers, but they're not going to change the EBITDA, and we'd have to sync to the EBITDA, so it's a lot of extra work that we don't really need to do, right? However, if you're doing this in the real world, right, they will make you forecast cost of goods sold at SGNA and sync it up with your EBITDA, right? But for our purposes, I'm simplifying this a little bit because the model doesn't really know, and, and EBITDA is the key number. So we're going to directly forecast EBITDA. That's why I skipped those other cells, okay? Now, next, we're going to forecast depreciation and amortization as a percentage of sales. So H8 equals G8, it's placeholder. And again, that's going to be a yellow cell. Next, we're going to forecast our operating income or EBIT in 2025. That's a formula. So equals H9 EBITDA, which is H7, minus the DA, H8, 12.3%. Okay. So we're solving for our EBIT operating income margin, right? Because again, it's based on the EBITDA. So I don't want to forecast that separately. So EBITDA minus depreciation is the EBIT, right? So we forecasted the two above, create the third. But very quickly, we forecasted an EBIT margin for Nike in 2025, right? Next, tax rate. We're going to have to forecast a tax rate for Nike that's realistic. Placeholder equal the previous year. So G10, H10 equals G10, yellow. No PAT, we're going to solve. The formula for no PAT is our operating income times one minus the tax rate, okay? Or if you want to be lazy, I've already put that correct formula in cell G11. So you can copy G11 over to H11 and get a no PAT of 10.5%, which is not yellow. It's all based on the two above. And the final ratio in the income statement we're going to forecast is non-operating gains or losses. So H12 equals G12, and again, yellow. So very quickly, <clears throat> we have forecasted these ratios for Nike. Questions so far? All right, we're gonna do six forecast years. So take column H, select it, copy it, go to column M, select cross, paste, <clears throat> you now have six years of forecasted ratios for the income statement of Nike. All right? Now, <clears throat> don't drag and drop. All right? Exclamation point in this class. Copy, paste. All right? And the reason why, <clears throat> and I tell you from years of experience, Microsoft will screw you. I used the wrong word the last class. Microsoft will completely screw you. And, and you don't like drag and drop, right? Because here's why. If you drag and drop, click and drag across, every now and then, it's random. Microsoft will say, aha, you were trying to create a series and I'm gonna put the series in for you and put these numbers consecutively. But it won't tell you it did it, right? And so your model will not work. It will be unbalanced and you'll be tearing your hair out. because, like, what the hell did I do wrong? And you didn't do anything wrong. It's Microsoft screwed you because Microsoft created a series and didn't tell you. It is something it just arbitrarily does sometimes when you drag and drop. It's not consistent. And it just drives me crazy. So the way to avoid that is don't drag and drop, right? Unless you're paying attention when you drag and drop and say, oh, did I create a series? Oh, we did it right. But then you have to do that every single time. So in this class, my recommendation, copy paste. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so we have six years worth of forecasted income statements, percentage of revenue. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the income tab and we're gonna create the actual income statements, All right? So our first ratio is EBITDA as a percentage of revenue in 2025. So go to, on the income tab, H8, and we're gonna repeat this process a bunch today. So equals 2025, 2025 revenue, so H3, times ratios tab, EBITDA's percentage of revenue in 2025, which is H7. So 
that is our forecast, 7.1 billion for EBITDA in, oh, sorry, put in the wrong cell. In cell H8, make sure you put in cell H8, not H7, a mistake. A lot of cells on here. So in EBITDA, cell H8 should be H3 times ratio is H7. Depreciation, similar process. So for depreciation, H9 equals revenue H3 times ratios. Depreciation amortization is H8 for 2025. 798.3. Operating income slash EBIT, solve. Equals EBITDA, which is H8, minus DA, which is H9, 6328.9. So again, very quickly, we have forecasted an operating profit in dollars for Nike next year based on those ratios. Everybody follow along so far? Okay. Next, <clears throat> interest expense. As you have read in the book and will be tested on the midterm, because again, solving formulas is not enough if you don't understand what you're doing, okay? So as I told the last class, who didn't seem to, in many cases, own or even read the book, that's okay, it's up to you. But when you do the midterm, one of the things is that the book tells you that we use a target capital structure in the future in an enterprise DCF valuation, which basically means we don't change the debt to equity ratio. That's why we have the constant capital structure, you leave the WAC alone and you don't vary the WAC by year, right? So in this case, since we're not gonna vary the WAC, we're not gonna change the capital structure, whatever debt they have, they keep, okay? Whatever interest expense they pay, they keep paying on that debt. We don't change it, right? And it's irrelevant to the valuation anyways, because the payment of the interest is based on the cash available for the CFI and the valuation is based on the operating free cash flow, which means any debt or equity switch has zero impact on the valuation anyways. We're just doing this to complete an actual income statement. Okay? So therefore, interest expense equals the previous year. Okay. And by the way, that's, that's a question on the midterm exam. And I'm sure everybody followed everything I said. So that's when you get to the midterm, that's the difference between the midterm and the other assignments. It's gonna test you on the theory of this class, as opposed to, do I know how to solve a formula? So it's the why of what you do. All right, so, and by the way, if I have, you have questions about anything that's said here, now's a good time to ask, as opposed to waiting to struggle on the midterm. All right, so back to interest expense equals the previous year. Okay, interest income, same concept, equals previous year. <clears throat> FX gains and losses, zero. I don't know what exchange rates are going to be in 2027. Neither does Nike. So forecasting gains and losses on FX is really hard to do. So we're not going to do it. We're going to assume most companies hedge. <clears throat> we're going to put it at zero. If you ever want to put something in, you can always override a zero. But I'm also telling you it will have no impact to the valuation. Okay, So we're going to leave that as zero. FX gains and losses, or oh, sorry, income loss from affiliates uh, equals the previous year. So H14 equals G14. Whatever gains and losses they have from affiliates, they're going to continue. Non-operating gains and losses, that's a ratio. <clears throat> equals 2025 revenue, H3, times ratios, H12. <clears throat> Pre-tax income is basically operating income. You can see the signs on the left. Minus interest, plus interest, minus interest expense, plus interest income, minus FX, minus loss for affiliates, minus non-operating losses. So we can either do that, or if you want to be lazy, I'm going to be lazy. I have that formula in cell G16. So copy G16, paste it to H16, pre-tax income, 67, 18.5. Next, we need an interest expense, or sorry, an income tax expense. So for income tax in cell H17, we take our pre-tax income, 
which is 816. And we multiply that by ratios, 2025 forecasted tax rate. That is H10, 1002.8. If I take my pre-tax income, and I subtract my income tax, yeah. equals pre-tax income, minus tax, 57.15.7 of income before extraordinary items. Next, extraordinary items. By definition, an extraordinary item is non-recurring. It's one time, by definition. It's extraordinary. It shouldn't have happened out of the blue. So therefore, I don't know what extraordinary companies are going to have in the future, and you do that. So zero. It shouldn't reoccur. Right? Now, technically... <laughs> Let's say Nike is going to lay off a bunch of people and they take a reserve for potential layoffs next year. Okay. Well, that might be a one-time extraordinary item I could put in. All right. So you can always go back and change something. All right. But I'll also tell you, it will not have an impact on the valuation. So things that don't really impact the valuation, I'm trying to minimize that anyways. So zero. Net income before minority interest is the income before extraordinary items minus extraordinary item. So equals H18 minus H19. <clears throat> and that's our net income before minority interest. Minority interest. Nike doesn't have minority shareholders. They're not paying minority dividends, but another company might. And because we're leaving the cap structure alone, whatever dividends they're paying, they're going to keep paying. All right? So equals H21 equals G21. Net income equals the net income before the minority interest. So H20 minus H21, the minority interest, and that'll get us 57, 15.7. So we have now completed a forecast for Nike's net income next year, which could technically finish our TII. What I'm going to do, though, is I want to solve for a change in retained earnings, which requires some items from the cash flow statement, which are the dividends. So net income minus dividends is change retained earnings, right? So the first, next line item is cash preferred dividends. Again, Nike doesn't have preferred stock and it doesn't have preferred dividends, but another company might. If they did, we're gonna leave the dividends alone, just like we left the debt alone. So whatever dividends they pay, they keep paying, equals the previous year. So G23, H23 equals G23. Other adjustments to equity. These generally occur when FASB makes changes to GAAP. Okay? And as a result of that, you have to restructure your statements. So for example, a couple of years ago, FASB eliminated operating uh, leases and said all leases have to be capitalized. So companies had to go back and readjust their statements to capitalize all the leases, okay? Generally, these are paper transactions. They have no impact on cash because the accounting statements and the tax statements are different, okay? And so therefore, historically, most other adjustments do not affect cash. And so therefore, we're not gonna care about them in the future, right? Matter of fact, we don't know what FASB is gonna do in the future. So it's hard to forecast changes they're gonna make that we don't even know that they've made yet. So, and when they do, they usually don't affect cash flow, and our model is a cash flow model. So, other adjustments to equity, zero. Okay. Again, real world, you work at JP Morgan, they'll make you actually do that. They'll make you make the accounting adjustments when forecasting net income. Right. That, by the way, in Bloomberg can be seen <clears throat> EPS gap. The EPS gap involves all the accounting. And then they strip out all that and actually do EPS adjusted and say, forget about the accounting shenanigans that nobody cares about except the accountants and their fee, their billable fees that generate them, all right? Because it has zero impact on cash and then let's adjust them out to get back to the real number. So again, it'd be nice if the accountants actually just made it more straightforward 
But again, it's going to keep many of you busy and, and rich as you go through your careers. Okay, that's how you become a partner. All right, so back to this. Net income available to common shareholders is the net income minus the cash preferred dividends. I want you to take cell G25, copy it, go to L825 and paste it. 5715.7. That's our net income available to common shareholders before common dividends. Nike paid a common dividend last year of 2.169 billion. Again, we're going to leave the cap structure alone. So we're going to keep paying that level of dividend. Equals the previous year. Change to retained earnings. Take your net income, subtract the dividends, whatever's left goes into retained earnings. So technically we would take cell, you can see on the left, H25 and subtract H26. But if we do that, it's gonna create a problem because that dividend is a negative number. And if we subtract a negative number, that double negative will essentially add the number, not subtract the number, and we'll get the wrong retained earnings, okay? So what we actually have to do here is we have to take H26, sorry, H25, and we have to add the negative dividend in H26 to get our change in retained earnings of 35, 46.7, right? And this is another best practice. <clears throat> you have to know your data source, right? We are tied to Bloomberg. Bloomberg gives income statement costs as positive numbers. For example, depreciation, 798.3. That's a positive number. Interest expense, 269. That's a positive number, okay? Problem is, Bloomberg gives cash flow data as negative numbers. Dividends, negative 2169. So you gotta know your data source. Okay, and since I know it's coming as a negative number every time, I add the negative number rather than just subtract it every time because it's not coming as a positive number, it's coming as a negative number from the database, okay? And that's part of the best practice. Here's the other half. This is why I'm telling you this model's tied to Bloomberg. Let's say you decide to use cap by Q in the future, okay, because you don't have access to Bloomberg. You wanna use this model. Well, then you have to make sure that every data coming from Cap IQ is in the same format as every field coming from Bloomberg or the model's gonna break. And so we're not gonna worry about that in this class. So I'm telling you, you're building a model tied to Bloomberg because we know this data source gives us this data in this format every time. Other data sources do not match Bloomberg's format and might give you positive or negative numbers in different places, and that could be a problem, okay? So if you ever wanna reuse a model like this with a different data source, that's the type of stuff you got to really check and really use, okay? But again, we're not worried about that this semester because everything we're doing this semester is tied to Bloomberg. All right, once we got this number, take column H, select it, copy it, go to column M, paste it. We now have six years of forecasted income statements for Nike. And so this is the part that you'll appreciate. Go to the tab called TII, take column G, select it, copy it, go to column M, paste it. You now have six years of forecasted balancing TII. Wouldn't that have been nice for your last homework assignment? Take cell H1 on the TII, call this a forecast. and then take H1 and copy it to M1. The label those are the forecast years. So in less than 30 minutes, we have forecasted Nike's income statements and translated them into Nike's forecast to TII. The number that you should see in cell M17 is 6024. If you're following them, that's the number you should be matching. Questions about anything so far? Need to see a number? All right. <clears throat> now that we have forecasted the income statement, we're going to go back and forecast the balance sheet for six years. Mm -hmm. So back to the ratios. All of these balance sheet ratios, there are 11 of them, <clears throat> are a percentage of revenue. 
we're going to forecast all the ratios as a percentage of revenue. And those are the items that are generally part of operating invested capital. Okay, that's what we're going to primarily forecast. So starting with <clears throat> accounts and notes receivable. Sell H14 as a placeholder, same level as last year, equals G14. We're going to make that sell yellow. Then select cell H14, copy it, select a range down to M23, paste. So all we're doing is repeating equal to previous year for six years for every one of those numbers. Okay, just being a little bit efficient at doing that. So we're just repeating the balance sheet ratio for six years. We didn't do row 24, right? So again, I wanna tell you about two additional best practices. <laughs> Number one, the reason why every ratio is a percentage of revenue, right? Is it actually makes the forecasting of the balance sheet easy because when we grow revenue, the balance sheet grows, okay? And it grows at these ratios. So rather than forecasting the balance sheet every single time, we, we basically can have the forecast, the balance sheet almost auto forecast when revenue. So of course the revenue would actually forecast the balance sheet. Makes our lives a little bit easier, right? And then the final one is IC to sales. IC to sales is this ratio in the tree. These are the historical IC to sales. And <clears throat> these, are the forecasts that I see to sales, okay? And so the whole point of doing an IC to sales forecast is a sanity check, right? Nike spends somewhere around 27 to 30 cents of invested capital as a percentage of sales on their balance sheet today. I don't want my ratios to have that number to become 10 cents per dollar of invested capital to sales because that would not be a reasonable balance sheet. So. I call this the sanity check because I want to see what those ratios do to the ratio of IC to sales over time. And if it looks far different in the future than today, then it kind of flags it for me to say, oh, I don't have a reasonable forecast for Nike's balance sheet. Okay. So that's why this ratio is here. So take cell G24, which is basically invested capital, which we haven't built yet, divided by revenue, take that cell, copy it, go to M24 and paste it. So it's gonna be zero right now, but once we finish the balance sheet, that'll pop in forecast that I see the sales ratios. All right, now we have the ratios. We are gonna go forecast the actual balance sheet. So go to the balance sheet tab, starting in cell H1. That is a forecast. Starting in cell H2 equals the previous year plus one. The first ratio for the balance sheet accounts and notes receivable. So on the balance sheet, that is H6. So starting with H6, <clears throat> what am I gonna do? We're gonna repeat 11 times. Okay, so to do the accounts receivable forecast for 2025 equals in H6 equals income tab 2025 revenue, which is H3 times ratios H14 which is accounts and notes receivables, a percentage of 2025 revenue. Enter 4439.5332. Go from H4 all the way down to H33, format, comma, one decimal place. So 4439.5, just to be consistent with the format of the historical numbers. Okay. Same process for unbilled revenue. 
So eight seven on the balance sheet equals 2025 revenue income H3 times ratios, 2025 unbilled revenue as a percentage, H15. Now, right now that ratio is zero because Nike doesn't have unbilled revenue, but another company might. Right? For example, an airline. <clears throat> right? So because we're using a reasonable model, we still put it in as a placeholder, even if it's zero. Other current assets, or sorry, inventories next. So for H8 equals income, H3 times ratios, H16. Other current assets equals income, H3, so 25 revenue, times ratios, other current assets as a percentage of that, H17. Next, we're gonna forecast long-term investments equals income H3 times ratios H18. <clears throat> Net fixed assets is PPE equals income H3, <clears throat> 2025 revenue times ratios, net fixed assets, H19. Other long term assets, next one, equals income H3 times ratios. H20. Accounts payable, which is H19 on the balance sheet tab, <clears throat> equals income H3 times ratios H21. Two more to go. Other short-term liabilities equals income H3 times ratios H22. And finally, other long-term liabilities equals income H3 times ratios H23. So those are the balance sheet ratios that we are forecasting off the ratios tab and the corresponding numbers. Did everybody get those? All right. Now we have to finish up the balance sheet, okay? And it's gonna be very important when we finish up the balance sheet that we number one, get it a balance, and number two, we don't have a circular reference. Anytime you see an Excel model that has a circular reference, it's an invalid file. It changes every time you hit, hit enter. So in this class, any circular reference will not be graded full stop. You'll get a zero. Okay? You cannot turn in a model that's invalid. Okay? It's like you cannot turn in a non-balancing model. Right? So <clears throat> in this class, I'm going to show you how to create a forecast without a circular reference every time. So back to this. We forgot one item that's actually key ratio. Yes. Or did I put the wrong cell? Should be in 24, not 23. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you gotta be very careful as well. A lot of cells here. Thank you for pointing that out. So that should have been H24 for long-term liabilities. Same formula, income H3 times ratios H23. Thank you for pointing that out. We need to forecast operating cash. Now that ratio is actually on the assumptions tab, not on the ratios tab. And you might say, why did he put it here? But the answer is assumptions are universal. Ratios are year by year. Operating cash is a minimum amount of cash companies always need to have. If you ever run out of that, it's bad. It doesn't matter what year you're in. So we're gonna say that's a floor. And so therefore it's on assumptions because it doesn't change, okay? 
In this case, our placeholder is 2% of revenue, so B3 on the assumptions tab. So on the balance sheet, <laughs> operating cash is a percentage of revenue, that's H4 on the balance sheet, equals income, H3, 25 revenue, times assumptions, B3. Operating cash is percentage of revenue. We hit enter. Thousand thirty point one. Okay. Now I'm going to show you how to again finish the balance sheet without the circular reference. We're going to start with the liabilities and equity. Okay. So finishing up liabilities and equity. We didn't have a number for short-term borrowings. That wasn't a ratio. Because we're leaving the cap structure alone, we're leaving the debt alone. So whatever debt they have, they keep, just like whatever interest they keep paying on that debt that they keep. So for debt, H20 equals G20. Current liabilities, sum of the three above, equals the sum. <clears throat> of the accounts payable, short-term borrowings, <clears throat> and short-term liabilities, 10, 16.8. The next row down is long-term borrowings. That's long-term debt, same concepts. We're leaving the long-term debt alone. Whatever they have, they keep, <clears throat> equals the previous year. Pension liabilities, same idea. We're leaving the pension alone, equals the previous year. Long-term liabilities is the sum of the three above. It's the sum of the long-term borrowings, the long-term liabilities, and the pension, age 23 to age 25. So 1309.4.4. Total liabilities equals our current liabilities, which is age 22, plus the long-term liabilities, which is H27, or sorry, H26, 23713.2. So that is the forecast for their total liabilities for 2025. Everybody follow those numbers? Am I missing something? All right, now we're gonna forecast the equity. Nike does not have preferred equity. Another company might. <clears throat> whatever it is, like the debt, we're leaving the cap structure alone. So whatever preferred equity they have, they keep. Equal the previous year. Same thing for minority interest. If they have a minority stake, they keep the minority stake. Equal the previous year. Share capital and APIC is additional paid in capital. That's the common stock issued at par value, okay? So again, we're not gonna issue or repurchase stock. We're gonna leave the equity alone. Equals the previous year. So equals H30 equals G30. Retained earnings, we gotta solve for. All right, so next year's retained earnings is a formula, okay? Again, net income minus <laughs> dividends is change in retained earnings. Last year's retained earnings plus that change is this year's retained earnings. So this is the formula. For next year's retained earnings for Nike, H31 equals last year's retained earnings. So H31 equals G31 plus, from the income tab, H27 is how much the change in retained earnings should be in 2025. So 4564.7. That should be the new retained earnings, assuming that income same comes true. If we sum those four items up from preferred through minority interest, share capital, and retained earnings, that is total equity, which would be 17976.7. If we take our total liabilities, 
which is H27, and we add them to the total equity, 17,976.7, we get our total liabilities and equity. Forty-one six ninety. I told you our balance sheet has to balance. I'm going to show you the trick that will work every time. Go to total assets, which is H16, equals H33. There you go. Balance sheet always balances. Assets will always equal liabilities and equity. Yes. Got to get the balance sheet to balance. So take total assets at H30 equals liabilities and equity, which is H33. Force the balance sheet to balance. Ha ha ha. So here's the point. All of the assets above have to add to that number every time. And to ensure that that happens, we are going to use the concept of a plug. Because we're going to solve for something to make sure it adds up every time. The plug is excess cash. So basically, we are going to solve for the excess cash that leads to the balance sheet balancing. That's how you get around the circular reference, by the way. All right. So in order to plug excess cash for 2025, we need to finish up the other balance sheet items we didn't forecast. What is not forecasted? Well, we just forecasted operating cash, and we need to make an edit to that cell. So take cell H4 and edit that cell so assumptions B3 has a dollar sign in front of the B and a dollar sign in front of the three. This will tell Excel to make assumptions B3 an absolute reference. Because when we copy and paste this forward to the future years, C3, D3, E3, and the assumptions there is no C3, D3, E3, B0, okay? So by making an absolute reference, we can copy and paste. It'll always refer to cell B3. The other number that we got to deal with is goodwill. There is no forecast for goodwill. Remember, goodwill comes from acquisitions. It's the difference between the price and the value of the assets that were acquired. That's why increases in goodwill suggest acquisitions. But here's the point. I don't know who Nike's going to buy. They don't know who they're going to buy next year. How do you forecast goodwill? You don't. Okay? You don't forecast acquisition. Right? However, <clears throat> goodwill can theoretically stay in your balance sheet forever unless it's impaired. Even if it's impaired, it's a non-cash item. It's another thing that just gives the accountants billable hours that has no real value to the firm. Right? So if goodwill impairment has zero impact on cash, we don't really care about it. Right? So if they impair it, whatever. Right? So, but we got to have balancing balance sheets. So placeholder, goodwill, H13 equals G13. So theoretically, if you don't pair it, it stays there forever. So we'll just leave the goodwill. Now that we have all the balance sheet items forecasted, except for excess cash, we solve for excess cash. Okay, so this is called a plug. So for excess cash, H5, equals total assets, 816 minus everything else. So 816 minus operating cash, minus H4, minus accounts receivable, H6, minus unbilled revenue, H7, <laughs> minus inventory, H8, <clears throat> minus other current assets, H9, minus long-term investments, H10, minus Net fixed assets, H11, minus goodwill, H12, minus other long-term assets, H13, I'm sorry, H13, H12 was net fixed assets, 13 was goodwill, 14 is other long-term assets. So H16 minus H4, minus H6, H7, H8, H9, H11, 12, 13, and 14. Okay. When you hit enter, what's left will be excess cash, 14058.1. So Nike's excess cash balance next year should grow to 14 billion 58.1. Never get that number? 
Okay, now we're ready to solve for current assets. We just sum the six items above. So H10 equals sum of operating cash, excess cash, accounts receivable, unbilled revenue, inventory, and other current assets. So basically H4 to H10 or H9. Uh, sum H4 to H9 to get 28,927.3. Then we're going to sum our long-term assets. So for H15 equals sum the long-term investments, H11, through the other long-term assets, H14. Add those four items up. Twelve seven sixty two point six. We now have a balancing balance sheet with no circular reference. And you don't have to do this, but just to show you, equals current assets plus long-term assets 41,690. We've matched the plug. We've matched the other side by adding up everything. So we know the balance sheet balances and everything works. Ever get that number? We're good. You don't need to sell. That was just to show you. Home stretch. Take column H, select it, copy it, Go to column M, paste it. You now have six years of forecasted balance sheets. Okay. Yeah, fortunately, it's just the power of the board. Get electrocuted up here. Uh, so H, copy column H through all the way through column M. All right. So you should have six years of forecasted balance sheets. Again, the part you'd appreciate, go to TFI. Take column G, select it, copy it, go to column M, paste it. You now have six years of forecasted and balancing TFIs for Nike. Take H1, that's the first forecast year. And then take H1 and copy that to M1. Now that you have the TII and the TFI forecasted, go to the CFI tab, take column G, copy it, go to column M, paste it. You now have six years of forecasting and balancing CFIs. Wouldn't this have been nice for your last homework? <clears throat> Then take column out H1, same, same thing. This is now forecast. Copy that to M1. Just the label historical versus forecast. Go to the EP tab, copy G, column G, column M. You know, have six years of forecasted economic profits to balance. Change your label on H1 to a forecast and copy H1 to M1. Once you've done that, save your file. You've completed homework eight. That's what you need to be by Monday. Here's how the TAs are going to check this. They're going to open your Excel spreadsheet, make sure everything is there, all the tabs are there, all the years are there, and then they're going to go to the CFI. And the number they're looking for is 2379.9. That needs to be M37. Did you get that number? Then you have two points. If it's assuming you submit the file. If you didn't get that number or you didn't get to this point, this class is being recorded and this is where you need to get to by Monday, 10 a.m. So you submit that file. No write up. Okay. 
And so it's binary. You have this matching two points, you don't, you get zero. You got to make sure it matches. And I'm and we need to be hard on this because if we're going to build a reusable model, I need to make sure you built the model right. Okay, so we all need the same model. So <clears throat> here's the idea. Right now, save this file. You can upload this to homework eight right now and get the two points. If not, Monday, 10 a.m. What we're going to do next Wednesday, because Monday's presentation day, is we're going to start right here. And then we're going to keep building the valuation. Okay. So, and then we're going to put in more realistic numbers for Nike and value Nike. So that's where we're going with this. But the, this is the predicate that basically says we needed to forecast the CFIs, have the ability to forecast the CFIs to do the valuation. So this forecast is the statements of the CFIs and the cash flows. That's what we've done in the first part of our valuation. Questions? <clears throat> so just because we're going to have a lot of files up here, I'm going to call this file save as. Instead of start, I'm now going to call mine part one. And this is section 401. It's also the one I'm using for the video. Right. Now, I am not uploading this file. Right? This one you have to create yourself. Okay? And again, we're going to build on that next week individually. This is an individual assignment. Questions about anything? Is there anything you need to look at, confused about, need to see before we close? Yes, sir. Um, um this might be like something I gotta ask you after class, but on the CFI, mm -hmm. uh, you mean nine instead of zero? Okay, yeah, let's look at yours individually. It might have been just like a, a because I missed a couple of times. I accidentally hit another key when I hit enter and it made it a value. So you might have just done something like that. Yeah. Well, if you now go back to the ratios tab on the invested capital sales ratio, you'll now see it's 0.27. Okay. So the whole point is actual 2024 Nike from the ROIC tree, 27 cents per dollar of operating invested capital for sales. Based on these ratios, we are forecasting balance sheets. Those balance sheets that forecast keep IC to sales at 27 cents. That suggests to us that we have reasonable balance sheets for Nike going forward. If that number was like 0.15 in the future, then I just didn't grow the balance sheet enough with sales to represent a reasonable balance sheet for Nike, assuming that their productivity stays about the same. Right? And that's an assumption we'll often make for most companies that their productivity in the future looks a lot like today. So this is just a way to ensure that is actually happening. Does that make sense? That's why we did that formula. Question over here? Uh, yeah. On the uh, balance sheet? So total assets for which year? Okay, 2025 total assets should be 41,690. It should match the total the formula for that, for total assets, is basically equals H33. We're just setting it to equal the liabilities and equity to kind of force the balance sheet to balance. And that's what I said, that's why we had to plug for something when we add everything up, we're plugging for the excess cash to make sure the balance sheet balances. That's what we solve for the excess cash in the very end. Any other questions? All right, again, you have the video, you have access to TAs this week, send me an email. Otherwise, hopefully most of you are done. And if you're not done, watch the video, get done by Monday. Uh, presentations, Monday, right, 10 a.m., presentation day. Right, so good luck with that. Look forward to hearing your presentations. See everybody on Monday. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.